to your courtesy of the red, white, and blue. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Quarantine Classroom with me, Mr. Eschbacher, getting you ready for the AP U.S. History Test. Remember, the test is on May 15th at 2 p.m. You'll be doing a 45-minute DBQ, and then they give you five minutes to upload that sucker. So as we continue to review, today we'll do a day on periods one and two. Now, this year's DBQ prompt will be on periods three through seven. But the reason we want to do one and two is there's no rule that says you can't, you know, go back in time to, uh, you know, draw some other information to create contextualization. So, I've arranged our incredibly high-tech board O period one here in bagpipe fashion, kind of like we do for our homework assignments. And uh, feel free to, you know, hit me up with questions, guys. And who knows? We might have a couple special guest visitors. We do have, of course, Teddy Roosevelt, my favorite president, and donated by one of my sons, the Stress Penguins, and, of course, the Almighty Amsco book. So, today when we talk about period one, remember, that's 1491 to 1607, and we said that was Native Americans, explorers, and stuff before the British. Okay? 1491 being the first part of the time period, and now, it's not specifically 1491, it's a symbolic number. In fact, there's actually a book written called 1491 with the idea that we're taking a snapshot of what the Americas were like before European contact, before Columbus in 1492. 1607, because that's the establishment of Jamestown, the first successful British colony, and that'll be what moves us into period two. All right, so looking at our big high-tech board here. Uh, when we talk about B, beliefs, ideas, and culture, basically what we would call social history, uh, we see some of that kind of prominent in period one, mainly focusing on religion and relationships. Before the Europeans come here, uh, a quick little social structure for Native Americans, it's important to understand we're different Native American societies, matrilineal, meaning family line, and thus a lot of family responsibility and power and influence goes down through the line of the mother, or patrilineal, where it's going down through the father's line. Uh, for example, in the case of the Iroquois, it was a matrilineal society. Big influence here, though, for beliefs, ideas, and culture is the Catholic Church. When you guys were in ninth grade, hopefully you learned the three G's, God, glory, and gold. Uh, the influence of religion upon the age of exploration. And uh, good examples of that, when the Spanish came to the New World, they brought Catholic missionaries with them. Priests, Franciscan monks, Jesuit monks, uh, and the Spanish, when they established colonies in what we now call New Spain, they created missions. And if you don't remember, a mission is a church with a fort built around it. You've all heard of at least one famous mission. It's in San Antonio, Texas, the Alamo. Uh, also related to beliefs. Bartolome de las Casas. We see him quite a bit as a document. He was a Spanish priest who kind of spoke out against abuse of Indians, against the encomienda system. He was engaged in something called the Valladolid debate. Uh, Valladolid's a city in Spain. And as a result of his, his efforts, the new laws of 1542 were passed, reforms to try to improve the rights of Native Americans. All right, so when we talk about A in our bagpipe chart, America in the world. Now, we don't actually have an America per se. We are talking about the Americas. So it's not really a foreign policy, but remember, this is a, the idea of America in relation to the rest of the world. A couple quick hitters. Again, I, in a normal year, you don't have a lot on period one, but it's good for contextualization. Uh, the Treaty of Tordesillas in the 1450s, when the Pope came and said, hey, I'm going to Pope. And he took a Sharpie, or at least the 1400s version of a Sharpie, and he drew what's called the line of demarcation along the New World. The leader of the Catholic Church dividing up the New World between two of the most powerful Catholic countries, Spain and Portugal. Uh, we have also with America in the world. You know, it's important to understand the idea of 
colonies being created that would fit with this idea of foreign policy and the first successful permanent European colony, now notice how I said European, not British, was St. Augustine, Florida. Okay, Very often, you know, we'll play basketball or something in class, if I ask a kid what's the first European colony, everybody jumps to Jamestown, but they forget about the Spanish. It's the Spanish who get there first. Uh, we get an unsuccessful British colony in Virginia at Roanoke, the, the missing colony that just disappeared. I'd also throw the idea of conquistadors, people like Hernan Cortez and Francisco Pizarro as an example of America in the world because they are going there as, you know, warriors from another nation and coming in and conquering and doing horrible things to people, so it kind of fits there. G. G is geographic interactions. How do people deal with their environment? How do they deal with their geography? How does their environment and their geography affect their be behavioral patterns? And we absolutely see this with Native Americans pre-1491 and then going on beyond. Uh, just the idea of Native Americans, in fact, is a really ethnocentric term because that implies like there's one culture. And it's really more something similar to what they have in Europe where there's many, 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 many different civilizations and each makes an adaptation and has incredible innovations based upon where they live. In the Southwest, we see the development of maize culture. Maize. We call it corn today. Rain makes corn. Corn makes whiskey. Whiskey makes my baby feel a little frisky. Complex irrigation systems to be able to grow corn or maize in the American Southwest. In grade school, you guys learn about how in the eastern woodlands, in the northeast, the Iroquois planted the three sisters together to be able to maximize their not just their crops, but also get complex proteins and stuff like that and have good nutrition. In the Pacific Northwest, we had the Chinook culture, which was based heavily upon salmon, upon whaling. They had tons of wood from cedar trees. In fact, the Pacific Northwest was a very wealthy in terms of resource region. Out on the Great Plains and in the Great Basin, in the middle part of the United States, not so much. And as a result, you had a more of a nomadic culture. People were hunter-gatherers, and they would travel in these bands or kind of clans, like extended families. So they didn't have as complex a political system, but they were relying primarily upon the buffalo. <laughs> and they used every single part of the buffalo to be able to meet the needs for their resources. Uh, we also have to talk about really the most important thing. In fact, if there's anything useful for period one, I'd have to guess, it's going to be the Columbian Exchange. The result, and you guys did this in ninth grade, and there's diagrams I put in your period one packet, the result of exploration and contact. New foods go to the new world and back to the old world. New animals, new world, old world. Invasive species of animals and plants. New diseases go to new world and old world people move. So if we look at the Columbian Exchange and we break it down in terms of Europe, how was Europe affected? Well, diseases. Europe gets syphilis. Uh, diseases. The New World gets measles, the flu, smallpox, chickenpox. In fact, it's diseases that really wipes out, cripples so many Native American societies, smallpox being the worst of them. Uh, when we also talk about this, we can talk about different food crops. The population of Europe skyrockets. It, it, its rate of increase, or how much time it takes to double the population, increases dramatically because of all the new foods, particularly potatoes. You know, I'm three quarters Irish, and hey, you know, it, it's not like they come from Ireland. Tomatoes, yes, Italian folks, you did not have marinara sauce without the age of exploration. Chocolate. What comes to the New World? Europeans bring sugar cane with them. They plant that in the New World, it prospers. Uh, Europeans bring wheat because, go back to religion, beliefs, those monks who come with the Spanish, they're Catholic, and you can't have Catholic Mass without Holy Communion, which is made out of wheat. Grapes, because the other big part of Catholic Mass, blood of Christ, so you need grapes to make wine. Animals. Europeans bring horses, cows, pigs. They bring back to Europe turkeys. 
uh, different kinds of plant species are accidentally brought, you know, as little bits of plant clinging onto European plows and stuff like that. All right. When we talk about our first P, politics and power, and we do see some good examples of power, of political systems. Pre-Europeans, we have some powerful empires, the Maya, the Aztec, and the Inca. We can talk about the political systems of Native Americans. For example, the Iroquois Confederation, the Mohawk, the Onondaga, the Oneida, the Cayuga, the Seneca. Or in grade school, a lot of you guys learned school. Seneca, Cayuga, Oneida, Onondaga, Mohawk. Later on, the Tuscarora Indians were brought in. And the Iroquois Confederacy was something, you know, you can look later on in history at our Articles of Confederation and see a lot of similarities. The diagram, the model for the Iroquois was the longhouse. And in Iroquois settlements, they would have a longhouse. And in the longhouse, each family unit would have a designated area. And at the center would be the fire. So in the Iroquois Confederation, the Onondaga Indians, they were considered the keepers of the fire. And they would get together, they would meet for purposes of trade, for purposes of defense. We can also talk about European efforts at power. Ferdinand and Isabella, they are the monarchs who do the Reconquista. They're the ones who drive the Moors out of Spain. They're the ones who kind of unite their two kingdoms together. They're the ones who fund the voyages of Columbus. And also the encomienda system. The Spanish tried to recreate European feudalism in the New World. Not just through the forced labor of Indians, but the Spanish create this social system which fits in with this idea of power with a rigid class system. At the top you have people who were born in Spain, peninsulares. And then you have people who are of Spanish ancestry but they're born in the New World, mestizos. I'm sorry, creoles. And then you have people who are a combination Spanish and Native American, they are mestizos. People who are European and African, they are mulattoes. And the Spanish kind of try to recreate this idea of a social hierarchy but also political hierarchy in the New World. I, identity. Whenever we talk about identity, we're looking how different groups of people, but also the United States as a whole, have come to kind of embrace or identify themselves as Americans. And if we talk about identity, you look for those underrepresented groups. West African slave trade. It's important to remember that the slaves who were brought to the New World by the Europeans primarily came from West Africa, what's called the Gold Coast. And Native Americans how really depending upon the civilization, their version of identity, of organization could be very, very different. Along the Great Plains, and this could fit, by the way, into power as well, but along the Great Plains, you had smaller family units called clans who were kind of like roaming bands of people. Now go to more complex civilizations like the Iroquois, or go out to Mississippian culture, and you go out near what we would now call St. Louis, and there was a massive city called Cahokia. Estimates are it may have had more than 100,000 people in it. Okay? And again, you can also take in this idea for identity of Native Americans. Bartolome de las Casas arguing, look, these are God's children. They're no different than the Spaniards. Therefore, they have rights. They have to be treated fairly. You could look at how the Spanish classified people in the New World. Perfect example of identity with their class system. Peninsulares, Creoles, Mestizos, Mulatos, okay? Peopling and migration. One of the themes throughout American history, in fact, a theme they could have you write about on the AP test, would be the idea that throughout American history we've been moving. We've had both internal migration, meaning people in America moving from one spot to another, and external migration, people coming into the United States, or what we kind of think of as immigration. Well, if we're doing period one, we're talking about exploration, it's all about people and migration. It's about movement. Before the Europeans, it's about those nomadic bands along the Great Plains who had to move to get their resources, the buffalo. It's about exploration itself. Columbus with his four voyages in, beginning in 1492. The world she's flat. The world that she's around. She's flat. Other European explorers like Henry Hudson, Samuel de Champlain. It's about the technology that allowed the age of exploration to happen. The astrolabe and the sextant for navigation. 
the compass, the caravel, the Portuguese ship, the latine or triangle sail. All these are technologies that allowed for exploration to happen. And sadly, it's also about the Middle Passage, the forced migration of people from Africa uh, on slave ships. And our last kind of topic for period one, E, which we say is work, exchange, technology. Who's doing the work? How is trade happening? What technology allows that trade and that work to happen? Well, again, if we're talking about labor especially, encomienda. When the Spaniards create their society in the New World, they have a system where you have people who are landowners who can force Indians to do agricultural work, mining work for them. Eventually how that begins to get phased out as Native American populations die and get replaced with slavery. And how, although slavery was something that the Catholic Church frowned upon, the Spaniards established a system called Asiento where you could get permission to bring slaves in. Pre-Europeans, the ancient city of Cahokia, in, again, near what we call St. Louis today, was a mecca, a center of trading. Uh, Pre-Britain, we're talking about the Spanish, and we're talking about, you know, later European civilizations. We have to talk about mercantilism. And this idea of reciprocity, and how the concept of property was different among Native Americans. You know, it's a form of exchange. Uh, in Native societies, reciprocity. If I need something, I use it. And if you need it, then you come use it. And how that's going to later on cause some clashes with Europeans who go, oh, wait, wait, why are you taking this? What? So that's kind of period one in a nutshell. I don't see a lot of period one in the AP test. Again, encomienda, Colombian exchange, those would be the two big ones I'd want to jump to. All right, we're back. Everybody take a stress break. Embrace the power of the stress penguins. Miss a lot of those little toys we have in the classroom. I left those guys to guard the classroom. All right, so now we're going to talk about period two for AP U.S. history. 1607 to 1754, or what we pretty much call British colonial America. Now, this doesn't mean we don't talk about other civilizations, but this becomes the time period dominated by the British. Remember, the Spanish get there first. The Dutch get there before the British. The French get there before the British. So why do we know the answer that the British won? Because sometimes it doesn't matter who gets there first, but who gets there the firstest with the mostest? And the British are able to most effectively colonize the New World, and of course they end up winning the Seven Years' War. So how do we have these dates of 1607 to 1754 in period two? Again, 1607 was the establishment of Jamestown, the first successful British colony. And 1754 will be when the Seven Years or the French and Indian War starts. And that's going to dramatically change all of history, especially change the way the American colonies relate to Great Britain. So if we look at our big board, right away you can see we've got a lot of stuff when it comes to B, to beliefs, ideas, and culture. In fact, I actually had to shrink that down. I'll elaborate on it more. If you were to get any, now, they're not going to ask you an essay about period two, but if they were to try to pull something into this DBQ from period two, okay, to me there's a couple things, and one of them especially is the impact of religions and beliefs. We talked about the pilgrims. What's another word for a pilgrim, pilgrim? That's right, a separatist. Uh, the Protestants who want to separate from the church family. They basically were the first religious refugees in America. They said, look, we just want to move away and be on our own. The Puritans who come in later on, they come in after. Now, kids get this mixed up, but the Pilgrims are 1620, Plymouth. They're the Mayflower. The Puritans come in 1629, and they establish the colony of Massachusetts Bay. In 1630, John Winthrop brings 15,000 Puritans with him, and it's a part of what we call the Great Migration. Winthrop becomes, sorry, yes, Winthrop becomes the governor of Massachusetts Bay. Uh, and when he does, he writes a document that you guys have seen from me before called A Model of Christian Charity, where he gives that famous quote, we shall build a city on a hill. The idea that they're going to make this moral and religious example for everybody else to follow. And we said that Puritan society was pretty strict, pretty tough. They valued education big time. Remember, they passed a law in colonial Massachusetts called Yield Deluder Act, 
when she said that every town in Massachusetts had to have somebody responsible for educating the kids. Small towns, it might be a mom. Towns that had 50 or more families, I think it was, had to actually hire a school teacher. Harvard and Yale. Now, Harvard's in Massachusetts, Yale's in Connecticut, but if you want to see the value the Puritans put on education, it's because they needed ministers. The first colleges in America were created to train ministers. We also said that being a Puritan was pretty tough. You know, the Puritans, they're a theocracy. If you break church law, you're breaking the law. And uh, I kind of made a little analogy. I compared them to an old Saturday Night Live character called the Church Lady. <laughs> well, isn't that special? <laughs> well, Puritan membership goes down, so the Puritans kind of changed the rules for who could be considered a full-fledged member with the halfway covenant. The other big thing to remember about the Puritans is as much as they are controlling of their town, remember, the meeting house or the church was not just the church, it was also the seat of power. It was like the town hall. It was the center of the town. Because they're a theocracy, because they're so rigid, they have an influence on other colonies who don't want to be like that. Roger Williams and Anne Hutchinson get kicked out of Massachusetts. Williams founds Providence, Hutchinson founds Portsmouth, and that later becomes Rhode Island. Screw you guys, I'm going home. You can contrast the Puritans uh, in New England with the middle colony of Pennsylvania. William Penn's holy experiment. Penn's a Quaker, and the Quakers, or the Society of Friends, believed everybody had the Holy Spirit, or God's inner light. And so Quaker women had you know, more rights than other women. Quakers become the first people to speak out against slavery. Penn, as part of his Charter of Liberty, said, look, you have to buy land from Indians. And in Pennsylvania, they had an elected assembly. Okay? Go down to Maryland, which was founded by Lord Baltimore, George Calvert. Now, he never got to bring his people over there. He died, so his son Cecil Calvert brought them over. And they created a safe haven for Catholics. And in 1649, the Maryland Act of Toleration was passed, protecting all Christians. So you see efforts at, you know, religious toleration. Roger Williams, again, the guy who founds Providence in Rhode Island, he's the biggest advocate of separation of church and state. But we will see this influence of religion throughout. For example, in most of the colonies, you had to be a male property owner to vote. In Massachusetts, you had to be a church member, if you want to see that religious influence. Uh, hey, America in the world. If I say mercantilism, you say, that's right, feed mama. Ew, Owen loves his mama. Okay, I always think about that movie, Throw Mama from the Train. All right? If I say mercantilism, you say feed mama. It's the economic system where the mother country gets provided raw materials from its colonies. In exchange, mama sells back finished goods. Mama protects the colonies. And mercantilism becomes one of the big underlying causes of the American Revolution because the mother country's always going to have what's called a favorable balance of trade. Mama country's always going to make more money than the colonies. And that will carry us into the American Revolution. The British will create laws during colonial times to enforce mercantilism. The Navigation Acts, which said only British or Americans could be crew members. The ships had to be owned by someone who was British or American. It restricted what goods could even be made in the colonies. There was the Hat Act, the Wool Act, the Iron Act to restrict and say, look, you guys can't make certain products in the colonies because we don't want to hurt British manufacturers. Again and again and again, the idea is this favors the mother country over the colonies. Now, the British don't strictly enforce mercantilism. We have this idea of salutary neglect. The idea that, you know, the British, they figured, look, as long as you're making us money, we've got bigger problems to deal with. We are trying to deal with the French, deal with the Spanish. And because they were kind of lackadaisical, the American colonies were able to develop ideas of self-government, more religious freedom. They also got used to kind of smuggling and sneaking around the Navigation Acts and mercantilism. Now, why do we care about this if this is something that is in period two? Well, mercantilism especially is going to carry into period three. Salutary neglect, we're going to see it's one of the things that ends as soon as period three begins. But the big idea, too, is throughout American history, we've had this question, 
the role of government in the economy. Has the government been hands-on or a little bit more of that laissez-faire hands-off? Certainly you could argue mercantilism is more hands-on, where the government's really restricting how things are done in your colonies. At the same time, when they go salutary and neglect, they're not enforcing rules. All right, also the America and the world. The idea of the different colonies, where they are and why they were founded. When we talk about New Spain, we are talking about Latin America, the American Southwest, so think California, Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, and Florida. And the Spanish are going there. They are trying to convert souls to, to the Roman Catholic Church. They are trying to get as much mineral wealth as they can, gold and silver. In fact, one result of exploration, Spain had hyperinflation. They had too much money. The you know, money lost its value. Go up north, way up north, to New France in the St. Lawrence River Valley. Modern day what we now call Quebec was the capital of New France. Down the Ohio River Valley, down the Mississippi. The French primarily tried to make money through fur trading with natives. Uh, the Dutch create New, New Netherlands and they have a city called New Amsterdam, we now call Manhattan. And the Dutch also were there for fur trading and they were really, really business oriented. So much so that the Dutch and the French, they intermarry with Indians more, they take more of a cooperative kind of, hey, we got to work together with you attitude with natives as opposed to the Spanish who want to conquer them and the British who kind of, you know, we're British, we like to have contempt for everyone. And the British who colonize, well, the eastern seaboard. They take New York from the Dutch. Ball game over. Yankees win. The Yankees win. They take Pennsylvania and New Jersey from the Dutch. And they colonize from Plymouth and Massachusetts all the way down to Georgia. And the British colonize because? Well, because. The word plantation actually is a word used by Sir Walter Raleigh. He was Elizabeth's right-hand man. He wrote a paper saying, here's why we need to create colonies. Effectively so that the Spanish don't. Every place we plunk a flag is a place the Spanish don't. So the British encourage a variety of reasons. What's that you say, Pilgrim? You want to go to the New World? Go ahead. Hey, the king owes you money, William Penn. You will be the proprietor or the owner of your own colony. You can make all the rules for the colony and as long as they follow the king's rules, you're all good to go. So there are different kinds of British colonies. You have corporate or joint stock colonies where the 1600s versions of corporations, or joint stock companies, literally own the colony. You have proprietary colonies, where people like William Penn were given control of a colony as a form of payment. And again, they could kind of run it in their own way. Penn really takes us to extremes. He has his Charter of Liberties. He designs this idea of religious tolerance in Pennsylvania. There would be an elected assembly. He even plans out the capital city of Pennsylvania. Philadelphia in a grid-like organized pattern. You know, it's like his dream home. Hey, if I could pick my own colony, how would I do it? By about 1750, all these colonies will become royal colonies, where there's a royally appointed governor who calls the shots. But there's one catch on him. The colonial assemblies in all 13 of those British colonies had elected assemblies. The people somehow got to vote for those colonial legislatures. And those legislatures paid the royal governor. And if they wanted to, they could kind of withhold his pay. So you start to see certain trends coming together. And one of them is this idea of colonial self-government. And again, throw in the idea of the Iroquois Confederation. How's the best way to deal with all these Europeans, but also with rival nation, Indian nations who've been around way before the Europeans? Create this confederacy. G, geographic interaction. Uh, in a normal AP test year, one of the essay topics that pops up a lot, so it could be something you might be able to dip into, is this idea of how geography affects colonial America. Uh, and one of the popular ideas was compare the New England colonies with 
the Chesapeake colonies. Now, when I say New England, I mean Red Sox fans, Patriots fans, people who talk about take the car down by the water, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, okay, New Hampshire, Vermont doesn't exist yet, just so you know. If we say middle colonies, that's New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware. If we say southern colonies, it gets misleading. Southern colonies could mean Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia. Or we could break off and have a subset and talk about the Chesapeake. And by Chesapeake colonies, we mean Maryland and Virginia. Very often they'll ask you to compare New England to the South or New England to the Chesapeake. In New England, you have shorter growing seasons. It's a colder climate. It's like us in Syracuse. You know, we have winter in construction. You have rockier, poor soil qualities. So you have smaller subsistence type of farms. You have a good coastline for natural harbors, places like Boston. You have huge forests for shipbuilding, for timber, to build boats. Uh, you have lots of natural resources. Cape Cod. The Puritans believed that cod was a gift from God because, again, they believed in predestination. They call it sacred cod. Look, oh, God's, he's taking care of us. He's giving us all this codfish. Whales. If you're going to build ships, you can also have trading in places like Boston become major trade centers. In the Chesapeake, though, you've got fertile soil, warm growing seasons, and you have a cash crop, cotton which means you're going to get very large plantations for a couple reasons. One, cotton is like an ecological time bomb. It kills the soil. So if you're going to be successful, you have to constantly have new land to plant on. So you get these big spread out plantations, as opposed to New England, where you have these very kind of close-knit towns with small farms and small you know, communities centered around a meeting house. In the Chesapeake, particularly in Jamestown, the first colony, Jamestown, which is now a part of Virginia, you have a high mortality rate, a high death rate. There's a couple reasons for that. One reason is they pick about the worst place to try to live. They pick a coastal marshy area because they think militarily-wise, look, it'll be easy to defend. In reality, they have problems with bad drinking water. They get diseases like malaria. Plus, they have way too many dudes. The guys who come to Virginia are trying to get rich, become explorers, become famous. They're not trying to put down roots. And they've done this in sociology. If you have a big sex imbalance, too many guys, not enough girls, hygiene problems arise, violence breaks out, people live shorter lives. In New England, because the Puritans and the pilgrims before them were trying to bring families, you have a better sex balance between men and women. You have more families, you have grandchildren, and you have longer lifespans. Now, the other big geographical thing to think of is slavery. Understand, slavery exists in all 13 of those British colonies in North America. Although, technically speaking, uh, when Georgia was founded by James Oglethorpe, remember Georgia was supposed to be a penal colony where you could go to work off your crimes, work off your debt, and debt was a crime. Uh, slavery was not allowed. Well, that didn't last too long before people brought slaves down from the Carolinas. So there's slaves everywhere. They might be working in harbors, in warehouses, uh, as domestic servants to people who are wealthy up in the north, but they're going to be growing cash crops in the south. Tobacco in the Chesapeake, Virginia and Maryland. Rice and indigo in South Carolina. Also, don't forget that the British colonies don't stop at Georgia. You have all those islands in the West Indies, places like Jamaica, where slaves had to endure the worst kind of slavery with the highest death rates working on sugar plantations. All right, politics and power, letter P. This could be something. It could ask you about trends in colonial self-government. Remember, when the pilgrims, that's right, the pilgrims, before they get off the Mayflower, they've been blown way off course. They were actually supposed to settle in the Virginia colony, and they got blown off course. Now they're in Cape Cod. They're so far away from Britain it can't be ruled. They're too far away from Virginia. And there's a lot of people on the Mayflower who aren't actually pilgrims or separatists. They're there because they're looking to start over in the New World and make money. So they had to come up with a document, an agreement to say, look, 
We'll vote on laws. Whatever laws we make, we all agree we're going to fall. That's all the Mayflower Compact was. But it's huge because it's the first step towards some type of self-government in America. It's a promise that we'll make a government, whatever laws the government makes, we'll follow. We see amazing steps towards self-government in colonial America. The Fundamental Orders of Connecticut, the first actual written out constitution, if you will, in colonial America. In New England towns, again, the meeting house, the church is the center of every town. And New England town meetings became the way laws were done. They had direct democracy. Matters were discussed, matters were voted on, and Thomas Jefferson even once said, if you want the best classroom for American democracy, New England town meeting. Voting requirements. Again, in Massachusetts, you had to be a church member. You had to be a male church member. Sorry, ladies. In the other colonies, you had to be a property-owning male. In Virginia, they have the first elected assembly, the House of Burgesses, kind of like a House of Representatives. Now, there's a catch in Virginia. If you want to be allowed to vote in Virginia, you have to own so much land, which means if you're going to get elected to the House of Burgesses, you're going to be a wealthy landowner, which means when they pass laws and taxes and policies regarding Indians, guess who that's going to favor? That's right, rich people. And that's going to be one of the things that causes Bacon's Rebellion later on. If we're talking about politics and power, we have to know how colonies are run. Again, remember the types of colonies. Proprietary colonies like Pennsylvania, where you have an individual owner. Corporate or joint stock colonies. Places like Plymouth. Like Virginia, originally, where it's a, royal, it's a royally approved corporation. And then later on, they all become royal colonies. The Dominion of New England. Now... I'm also not going to lie, I'm, gonna, I'm making these videos so that next year and the years after I can use these as a resource for kids. The Dominion of New England is a little blip on the screen, and the British should have paid better attention to it. It shows what happens when the British try to go away from salutary neglect. In the 1600s, the British get this idea that, look, they are going to restructure colonial governments. They're going to combine New York and the New England colonies into this one big mega colony called the Dominion of New England. And they put this guy, Sir Edmund Andros, in charge of it. And he cracks down taxes uh, on a lot of the freedoms that people had gotten used to. Well, when William and Mary happens and you have the glorious revolution in England, there goes the Dominion of New England. And we're back, gonna finish up period two and if we look at our high-tech board here, talk about identity. Again, identity can mean national identity, what it means to be America, what it means to be an American, but also what it means to be one of the groups, one of those subsets within American society. And how have their rights been denied or granted? What efforts have been made to fight for people's rights? How have their rights been taken away? How successful have they been? Uh, kind of like, you know, underdog history. Early this year, we read about a guy named Anthony Johnson. We said Anthony Johnson was one of the original 20 slaves to come to Jamestown in 1619. And we said that slavery early on was kind of like a quasi-indentured servant, quasi-slavery, kind of somewhere in between. Anthony Johnson was able to work on the side, purchase his own freedom, purchase the freedom of his wife, and then eventually owned his own land, and actually owned his own slave. And we wondered how it is that we transformed so much. Well, we talked about some different factors. How the price of cotton became more profitable, and therefore slavery became more profitable. Uh, but also Bacon's Rebellion, that uprising in colonial Virginia, among poor whites and indentured servants, which made the powerful, the wealthy elite guys in Britain go, look, we need to come up with a better source for labor. Uh, Maroons, the term Maroons. Maroon communities or runaway slave communities were created out in the woods in colonial times and continued uh, in the years that, you know, America was a country. I showed you a film this year about the Pequot War called The Massacre at Mystic. How the Puritans justified slaughtering men, women, and children uh, in the name of religion. And the truth was they wanted, they wanted access to wampum, to trade. 
King Philip's War. King Philip was also called Medicom, uh, where, again, natives in, up in New England fought against New England colonists, and you see the use of guerrilla warfare. Slave codes. As slavery became more entrenched and something more permanent, it changed. The idea that you could have manumission or you could work and get your freedom in these new slave codes. Slavery became a permanent thing. You could no longer gain freedom. Uh, the introduction of what was called chattel slavery, or slaves treated as property, meaning like when your children were born, they were slaves. You were a slave for life. They were born into slavery. They were going to be slave for life. For life. Uh, we mentioned Phyllis Wheatley, famous poet. She's an African-American slave during this time period. She wrote a very famous poem about George Washington. The Middle Passage. The Stone O Rebellion. 1735 in South Carolina, an uprising of slaves upset over the fact that South Carolina had begun to crack down on like kind of like the markets and the economies that they had and they could see that they were really being forced into a new type of situation where you know, they had a bad situation to begin with and now their rights were being taken away more. But also Pocahontas. Remember, Pocahontas was the princess of Powhatan. Powhatan was an Indian chief. He was the the most powerful leader in the area that the Jamestown settlers were in. And, you know, the, the popular story, kind of slash myth, with Pocahontas was that she saved the life of Captain John Smith and that she ended up marrying John Rolfe, the guy who kind of developed the process for using tobacco. And the Powhatan Indians kind of saved the Jamestown settlers when they were starving early on. The Pueblo Revolt in the Southwest. The Spanish began to really crack down on any non-Catholic practices, and it led to an uprising of the Pueblo Indians, who for a while were able to kind of push the Spanish out of their land. But also for identity, think about Maryland. Again, perfect example. You have a colony that was established as a safe haven for Catholics, and then as more Protestants began to move in, the Catholics there got scared that, oh boy, here we go all over again. So the Act of Toleration was passed, and what did it do? It said religious toleration for all Christians. Peopling and migration. This is a perfect example of peopling and migration because you have so many people establishing new colonies and moving. Jamestown, the first successful British colony, couldn't have been successful if it wasn't for John Rolfe and his method of curing and cultivating tobacco. The head right system. One of the reasons the British were able to get so many people into Virginia was to recruit people. They said, look, if you pay your own way, you get 50 acres of land. If you pay for other people, you get 50 acres of land for every person you bring. Think 50 bucks a head. Well, of course, that's going to stack the deck in favor of wealthy people, and it's going to lead to some wealthy people having massive amounts of land. Who do they bring over? They bring over indentured servants, and they say, hey, look, you sign this contract for four to seven years, and when it's done, you'll be free, but I'm going to pay for you to come over here to work. The pilgrims or the separatists, founding Plymouth in 1620. The Puritans, John Winthrop bringing the great migration of 15,000 Puritans in 1630. Even Georgia. Well, devil went down to Georgia and he's looking for soul to steal. Georgia's a funny place. Georgia was founded by a guy named James Oglethorpe who wanted to establish a refuge for people who were criminals and people who were in jail because of debt. And Georgia had some rules, like a, almost like a parole place. Um, Rome was not allowed in Georgia. In fact, the term bootleggers doesn't really start in the 1920s. It starts when George is created because people would literally ship bottles of rum and they'd smuggle them in their oversized boots. Slavery was not allowed, we already mentioned, although that's going to end up changing. But, uh, you know, Georgia is kind of Australia for U.S. history. The idea would later on the British created Australia as a colony for their criminals. And if you're talking about peopling and migration, the Middle Passage. You know, the treacherous, awful, terrible voyage slaves had to endure from the West African coast to the New World. Whether they're going down to the Caribbean or they're going up to North America. And last but not least, work exchange and technology. And if you're going to talk about work, you have to talk about indentured servitude. Again, this was a way for people who could not afford to come over to the New World to do it. They would sign a contract of four to seven years, at the end of which they would be promised some tools, some tobacco, which is a currency basically, and maybe some land. 
but that's going to create this very stratified system in England, and it's going to lead to social unrest in the form of Bacon's Rebellion. Eventually, Bacon's Rebellion is going to lead to indentured servitude being phased out and being replaced with a more strict form of slavery. If we're talking about exchange, you have to talk about triangle trade and its key ingredients. Molasses, sugar coming from the West Indies and Jamaica. Rum being made up in New England. And slaves coming from Africa. Okay? Triangular trade. Plantations and the cash crops that were grown there. Again, in Virginia and Maryland, you think tobacco. In South Carolina, it's rice and indigo, the stuff that was used to dye cloth. Uh, other trade goods. The French and the Dutch heavily invest in the fur trade. And because they have to do business with Native Americans to get that fur, again, they became more tolerant, um, intermarried more, and generally were a lot more peaceful with Natives. And again, don't forget the West Indies. Its role not just in the bringing sugar up to the New World, but also bringing slaves up. Slavery in the West Indies, places like Jamaica, was brutal. And if a slave could survive there, any slave who was then sold up in the New World was considered more valuable and could get a better price. So triangle trade's got you know many layers to it. Work exchange and technology. How's that exchange going to be regulated? Through mercantilism, through the Navigation Acts. What areas do the most exchange? New England, you know, Port of Boston, technology. You're going to get some you know, new shipbuilding technology, but not a lot of big technological advancements for us to do here. Okay? So that's periods one and two in a nutshell for you guys. Again, this year's AP test will be on three. The essay prompt is three through seven, but it's good to have some background knowledge in case the topic, whether it's women's rights, think Salem, you know, the accusation of witchcraft as a way to uh, try to control women, work exchange technology, whether it's encomienda, slavery, um, role of government in things, whether it's salutary neglect or mercantilism, or participation in government, Mayflower Compact, House of Burgesses. There are some themes that we can reach way back just for our context or our synthesis. All right, until then, log off and plug in your chromies, homies. I'll see you soon.